as Ontario moves into the next phase of its public health approach to COVID-19 without mask mandates, among other things, the need for personal risk assessment looks different to different people. With us for her perspective in the nation's capital, Ontario Hub's editor, Sarah Trick. Hello, Sarah. Hi, Jan. All right, so why is lifting mask mandates problematic for high-risk settings? It's problematic basically because the people in high-risk settings, whether that is a hospital, a long-term care home, a home care setting, or even the bus, generally don't have a choice about being in those settings. Um, we've heard a lot of rhetoric lately about personal responsibility and choice. And to a certain extent, I think that is valid. Um, but if you need care in a long-term care facility, you don't have any other option but being there. Um, if you need to go to the hospital, you don't have a choice about going to the hospital. And in that case, people should be protected, in my opinion. When you heard about lifting uh, public health restrictions, such as masking and isolation periods, what was your personal reaction? I understand you, you, know, you took issue with that. It's not so much that I think no restrictions should be lifted. It seemed to me like we were lifting a lot all at once, and each restriction that or each protection that is lifted places more of a disproportionate burden on um, those who are at higher risk of getting COVID. So if we don't have isolation requirements, people might come into someone's home and give them care while being sick. Um, you want to say that nobody would do that, and I think most people would not do that intentionally, but in healthcare settings, there's a lot of presenteeism because settings are so so short-staffed, there's not much sick leave, workers in these settings don't make a lot of money, there's a lot of pressure to come in if you're feeling unwell. Because otherwise, people won't have care and they won't be able to get their basic needs met. So even with good intentions, somebody might end up exposing someone else to COVID-19 without these isolation requirements in place. Uh, in your article for TVO.org, you talk about this being sort of a, a betrayal of disabled Ontarians. Uh, I'm curious, were you surprised by the announcement and sort of the level of restrictions that were lifted? I do think it's important to point out that what is expiring at the end of April, if all goes well, is the emergency orders, the um, Reopening Ontario Act. A lot of these mask mandates and other mandates were put in place under the Reopening Ontario Act, which allowed the CMOH, the Chief Medical Officer of Health, to make these directives. And um, what the government is trying to do is phase those out and replace them with guidance. However, if guidance is left to individual settings, um, that puts people who use these settings at more risk. And I feel, or I think that lifting all of these things at once will just end up placing a disproportionate burden on people who don't have a choice who need their basic needs met. So the last time you were on the program, Sarah, we talked about how you were concerned about the narrative protect the vulnerable. Uh, in your recent column, you say that the subtext of last week's announcement is you're on your own for better or for worse. How are these two narratives at odds now? I'm hearing a lot of people say, if disabled people want to be protected, they should wear masks or they should ask people around them to wear masks. That's great, but the messaging around masks from the beginning of the pandemic has always been that my mask protects you and your mask protects me. So if I'm wearing a mask, I'm protecting you, but if you're not wearing a mask, you're not protecting me. There are masks that can protect the wearer. They are more expensive. Um, these are N95 masks or equivalent. I haven't seen anything that allows um, disabled or high-risk people to get these masks. There hasn't been any solutions provided for that. As well, if you ask an individual worker to wear a mask in your home, that's also great, but there's no guarantee that they will be able to provide these masks if their employer is not doing it for them, if it's not funded. Home care workers are already underpaid. They are not given, they're not reimbursed for extra costs such as gas. Um, none of the people that you are talking about or the people are talking about have the resources to do this on their own without help. 
Sarah, in your column, you talk about you know uh, someone who receives home care. Uh, you have attendants who come into your home. I, I'm curious, what has that conversation been like? Uh, I know that uh, some of your former attendants have actually become friends of yours, and, and sort of that conversation of you know um, pay equity, but also how many you know different homes a lot of these tenants go to. What has that conversation been like with them and sort of the risks that they're also going into, but also someone who receives care as well on the other end? If your agency doesn't have a mask policy, you can't ask them to wear masks. Or you can, but you might not you might not like the answer. And and you don't necessarily have a choice to refuse that service because you require that to do basic things like go to the bathroom or get dressed. It's not just that you might have to move say you're cleaning to another day. Um, for workers, I think it's been as terrifying as for clients because you know we didn't know how to um, provide care safely or receive care safely. Especially at the beginning, we didn't know what the risks were. Um, people in home care have been basically risking their lives every day for two years. They've gotten a temporary $3 wage increase. Um, but these workers haven't been protected and they haven't been supported to the extent that they need to, and neither have their clients. Now, Sarah, in your column, you you actually mentioned that, you know, you were sort of surprised by the announcements and it wasn't the, necessarily the column that you thought you were writing because you thought you would be, you know, providing some solutions for uh, people who live in congregate settings, uh, Ontarians living with disabilities, about how to live uh, in sort of uh, an environment post mandates, post-isolation uh, requirements, what would be a better approach in this new stage when part of the population can't wait to ditch their masks and others are scared or reluctant to do so? I would ask what's important. First of all, I am writing that column, but I do want to say it, it is not my job to provide solutions to this crisis. Mm -hmm. I am a journalist who writes columns sometimes. Um, maybe they get some readers, but I'm not in charge of any policies. I do not influence any policies. And it is not my job to decide um, how and what people should be protected from. Um, people, um, people have said that they're going to protect the vulnerable, meaning disabled people or elderly people. Um, there doesn't seem to be much in any of these strategies that allows for that to happen. If we had other things such as more available treatments, second generation vaccines, um, more cleaning of the air, free masks and tests provided to people who need them, I might feel a little bit more confident. But if we're just gonna say, this is on the vulnerable and the people that work with the vulnerable, and we're not going to give people any resources to do that, you're basically saying that these people aren't going to be protected and it is um, the cost of their deaths are worth it to society so that everyone can move on. Sarah Cherk, I want to thank you so much for coming on the program tonight. Again, a very important uh, topic. And uh, if our viewers and listeners are interested, they can go to tbo.org to read your columns. Thanks again. Thank you. It's good to see you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.